welcome uh, professor prasad and all our audience thanks for joining in uh, i'll start by explaining uh, i'll tell you first a bit about the biology society so yes. the biology society aims to bring together like minded uh, people who have a keen interest in various fields of biology and give them a chance to explore and enhance their knowledge to a high degree so we hope to open up opportunities and bring out the best in people and to know more about us uh, you can check out our website i'll put the link for the website in the chat box and okay. the moderator for today's event is sakshi so i'll hand over the space to sakshi hi everyone i'm sakshi and i'll be moderating today's webinar firstly i welcome you all to today's session we'll start with a short introduction to our guest speaker today and then we'll have a short q and a session at the end of the presentation dr jeevia prasad works currently as a professor at the department of geology at delhi university professor prasad's major fields are paleontology and paleobiogeography and he is well known for his work on the mesozoic vertebrate groups of india he has also been associated with various professional bodies like the journal of earth system science and is on the editorial board of the paleo botanist indian journal of geosciences and geological society of india bangalore he is credited with the discovery of the first cretaceous mammal from india and has also been awarded with many prestigious awards like the society of vertebrate paleontology preparators grant award shanti swarup patnagar prize L Rama Rao Bird Centenary Award, National Mineral Award of the Ministry of Mines, and the Research Award of the University Grants Commission. Welcome, Professor Prasad. And now I would like to hand over the space to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you about uh, fossils and uh, uh, how they help us in. Uh, gaining knowledge about uh, various aspects of science uh, so uh, in this uh, uh, talk basically i'm going to uh, talk about the uh, what are what is uh, what are fossils and how they are formed in the field and how you can actually use them to understand various uh, aspects related to both biology and geology because paleontology is at the Uh, uh interface of biology and geology so uh, it addresses uh, the issues related to both sciences so uh, i'll be talking about these things and also uh, briefly i will also discuss if the time permits uh, i will also discuss about the recent discoveries important discoveries from india so in geology uh, we use plate tectonics to explain most of the geological processes that are that happened in the past and that are happening today and also how the continents uh, got configured uh, like today or in the in, uh, what was their configuration in the past likewise uh, we also uh, uh, evolution actually is a is the most uh, unifying theory in biology uh, for understanding the how life has evolved over time and uh, and of course our a lifetime is not adequate enough to uh, observe these changes these evolutionary changes because the ch uh, changes evolutionary changes they take place over generations many generations so that we can only uh, see through the study of the uh, fossil remains uh, so in this talk uh, my i had uh, structured my talk something like this in this manner uh, so i'll briefly discuss about what are fossils uh where do we find them in uh, nature and what are the different kinds of preservations and uh what can we learn from the by studying the fossils and what are the important discoveries fossil discoveries from india during the last decade so uh i think most of you uh, we have studied uh, biology you may be having some idea about what is a fossil but in the original sense when it was uh, first the term fossil was given so when the name fossil was given uh, uh it was it has a different it had a different meaning i think there is some background uh, noise um so 
uh, it was actually given by Georges Agricola in 1546 when uh, uh, he suggested that anything that is dug up from the ground, whether it's a mineral, a rock, or uh, even maybe a fossil, but at that time people had no idea what what is a fossil. So anything that is dug up from the ground was named as a fossil. But the modern definition actually says that the modern definition says uh, that fossils are the evidences of uh, former existence of life, whether it is a direct evidence in the form of uh, uh, shells uh, or the skeletons or teeth or uh, bones. Uh, wood, stems, etc., which are known as generally known as body fossils, or it is indirect evidence in the form of traces. For example, uh, footprints, tracks, and trails that, that are left by the animals on the uh, sediments, and also burrows and borings, uh, tooth marks, uh, which are uh, mostly made by the predatory animals, eggshells, eggshells, coprolites. Coprolites are the uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, fecal uh, material or the fossil dung and gastroliths. These are the stomach stones. So these these are all together uh, uh, placed under the trace fossils. And uh, the science which deals with this, we you know it very well that it is uh, paleontology. And uh, uh, paleontology uh, it uh, includes several branches. Like we have uh, the invertebrate paleontology, where we are basically dealing with the uh, animals without a, a backbone, and then we have the vertebrate paleontology, where we are concerned mainly with the animals with the uh, backbone, like like us, uh, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, uh, mammals, uh, birds, all of them included here, and then paleobotany, where we deal with uh, essentially with the uh, plant remains. And there is another branch, which is known as micropaleontology, where we actually study the small uh, microscopic organisms. Uh, there are many such uh, uh, microscopic organisms, which I will show you later in another slide. And then we have the molecular paleontology, where this is the uh, branch, uh, upcoming branch, where we are actually uh, uh, trying to understand the, or the identify some of the uh, compounds, organic compounds, which are preserved in the uh, sediments, in the rocks, uh, in the form of biomarkers. So this uh, is uh, uh, is a uh, recent uh, uh, specialization that has been added to paleontology. And uh, I, I think you are, all of you know that uh, there are three kinds of rocks. Uh, one is uh, volcanic. Uh, the other, uh, sorry, the igneous, and the other one is uh, metamorphic, and the third one is the sedimentary rocks. So the within the igneous rocks, we have the plutonic igneous rocks, where the magma doesn't reach to the surface, so it remains beneath the ground, and like we have the granite, and then we have the uh, uh, igneous rock, which is a volcanic rock, like the basalt, for example, we have in the Deccan volcanic province in peninsular India or the Deccan plateau, we have all the volcanic rocks. And then we have the metamorphic rocks. This, these metamorphic rocks, they can be an igneous rocks or a sedimentary rock, which has been subjected to high temperature and pressure conditions, which will lead to the change in the composition of the rock. So these are the three different types of rocks. And Naturally, we uh, expect to find fossils only in sedimentary rocks, the layered sedimentary rocks, because these are the rocks which have been uh, uh, subjected to the igneous, metamorphic, and even older sedimentary rocks which have been subjected to weathering and erosion, and then they are transported into the aquatic uh, environment where they get deposited layer by layer. So these sedimentary rocks, these are the rocks in which you find essentially the fossils. Uh, you may find uh, fossils even in metamorphic rocks. If the metamorphic rock is a, a originally a sedimentary rocks, which has been transformed into a metamorphic rocks, you may find some kind of preservation. Uh, the preservation may not be so good as uh, in the case, case of uh, the sedimentary rocks, but you still you may find uh, some fossils if the the uh, rate of metamorphism is very low. The the uh, if the rocks have been subjected to to a low grade metamorphism, then it will 
not affect the fossil that much but you still the fossils get darkened in color because of the high temperature and pressure conditions so sedimentary rocks are the place or the rocks in which you expect to find therefore when you go to field first you have to see whether you are looking into a sedimentary rock or a, a metamorphic or igneous rock uh, for the fossils so the now the question is how do fossils form how they are formed in nature so once animal dies like for example here in this case we have the fish so when this uh, animal dies it Oh, ultimately after some time it will settle down to the bottom and the all the soft uh, parts of the animal get decomposed and what is left behind is the skeleton and this skeleton because this is uh, skeleton is a uh, uh, basically calcium phosphate its composition is calcium phosphate so it's a relatively hard material so it doesn't get uh, decomposed uh, immediately so if it is immediately buried by sediment so the skeleton, if it gets buried by sediment, then the uh, possibility of its getting uh, in, into transformed into a fossil uh, is very high. So the when the skeleton gets uh, covered by the sediment, then in a course of time, the sediment accumulation will take place and camp compaction of the sediment will take place and you will have uh, layers of uh, rocks. So you have uh, different layers of rocks. Uh, so the uh, skeleton, once it is buried under the sediment, the solutions or the uh, the fluids that are present between the pore spaces of the sediments, they are generally enriched in various kinds of minerals, like for, for example, calcium carbonate or cal calcium phosphate or silica, for example, quartz. And all these uh, minerals, which are dissolved in a dissolved state in the, in the water, they get they penetrate into the uh, pore spaces of the, the bones and they deposit there. So in this way, the uh, skeleton gets fossilized over a course of time. So that may take place over several uh, uh, millions of years. So we have, as I mentioned, there are two kinds of fossils. One is body fossil and the other one is a trace fossil. So the tra so you have uh, the body fossils, as I mentioned earlier, these are the hard parts mostly. Like for example, here we have the shells. So they, they are the hard parts mostly uh, like these shells or the teeth of a, sh a shark or the fish skeleton. Or you can also have pollens. Pollens are very small in size, less than 200 microns in size, and they are very hard to resistance. For example, if you subject them to acetic acids, they or any acid, uh, strong acid, they do not decompose uh, easily. But of course, oxidation can destroy them. And then we have the uh, impressions that are left in the rocks, like uh, these impressions of the glossopteris uh, leaf impressions. Uh, these are the things which are known as body fossils. And then you have the, and also you, you can have also impressions like this. And some of these impressions, some of them are known as impressions. Some of them are known as compressions. This is the terminology no, mostly used by the paleobotanists to denote the presence of organic material. So here you can see the black carbon uh, on the surface of the leaves. Here also you can see so this, these are known as compressions when you have the organic uh, film of the carbon, whereas this one is an impression where you don't find any organic carbon. So this is uh, basically a glossopteris uh, uh, leaf, and these are the other uh, plant uh, leaves from the Carboniferous time. And it, uh, also you can also have impressions like uh, these uh, insects, fossil insect uh, in the rocks. And then permineralization, as I mentioned earlier, when the uh, animals die on the skeletons or the shells, they get buried under the sediment, the, uh, the fluids which are present uh, between the pore spaces of the uh, sediments or the grains, between the grains, these fluids which are enriched in some minerals, they actually penetrate into the, uh, into the openings within the bone or the wood uh, so this is ha actually takes place when 
uh, you have uh, the uh, porous materials. For example, bones, if you uh, make a cross section of the bone, you can see the spongy layer. So those, through those spongy layers, these uh, liquids or the fluids, they move into the interior of the bone and then they deposit the, uh, the minerals. Uh, the inorganic minerals. That is how they get uh, uh, preserved as fossils. So uh, this kind of uh, mineralization or the uh, of the organic materials is known as permineralization, and this is very common in the wood uh, fossils. Most of the wood fossils are uh, actually um, completely transformed into silica, something like that. So the and also they can also occur in the vertebrate. Uh, bones like this uh, jaw of a megalosaurus or a, a wood fragment uh, which can be penetrated by the uh, mineralizing fluids and they uh, harden the uh, fossils. And then we have other kinds of uh, fossils like the casts and molds. Uh, mold is actually uh, once the, if you have a organic material, and this organic material, like, a, like let us say a stem or a, a bone uh, or a shell. So if they get dissolved uh, before the preservation, then they will leave a cavity in the sediment. So this cavity in a, a later stage, if this cavity gets filled with the mineralizing fluids, then they will deposit the uh, inorganic uh, minerals. So in a way, the cavity which actually represents the actual shape of the uh, shell or the bone or the wood, it will be transformed now into a, a cast. So a cast of the uh, original fossil, as you can see it here, it's a calamite, a carboniferous plant stem. And then you can also see here the uh, uh, root uh, of a, a carboniferous plant known as stigmaria. So these uh, are uh, very common. And then you can, this is here uh, just to show you how a, a mold can be, uh, can form a cast. So here you have a negative, uh, which gets filled with the, uh, many uh, cases, the fossils, they lose their volume, actually the original shape. For example, if you have the, uh, a, a plant material which is uh, deposited in sediments and then there is a gradual accumulation of the sediments over a period of time then because of the war burden the uh, original organic materials they get compacted and they become they lose the volume so originally suppose you have a spherical shaped uh, cross section it will become oval or elliptical in shape because of the uh, compaction so this uh, is very common particularly in plant fossils and then uh, pollens and spores, as I mentioned, they're, of course, they're very resistant to uh, even very uh, uh, concentrated acids, but they uh, can also get flattened by the, uh, flattened because of the compression. So uh, there are other kinds of uh, uh, preservations, like you can see here, this is a encrustation. So here, when you see from here, you don't see anything you don't think it is a, a fossil but when you uh, when we go to the field and we see nodules so the, these nodules when when we break them you'll find inside you have a fish skeleton like this one so this happens when you, uh, the skeleton becomes a nucleus for the uh, some of the uh, uh, carbonate precipitations like uh, in many cases, it happens particularly in, in areas where we have reducing environments. So in those areas, the, the uh, skeleton or a ske uh, shell or a bone, it becomes the nucleus for the formation of the concretion. So slowly this, the, the minerals accumulate over the uh, uh, shell or bone and they form this, this kind of nodules. These are very common uh, in uh, particularly in uh, reducing environments. So can, next please. And then uh, there are other cases where we find exceptional preservations like this, uh, like uh, some of these uh, fossils, like the, uh, I think you can uh, understand what they are. These are the mammoths, uh, extinct mammoths, and they are mostly found in, the fossils of these extinct mammoths are found mostly in 
the Siberian tundras and the mostly in uh, the uh, ice that covered under ice so they're completely frozen so in many cases though even the flesh is uh, looks way, uh, fresh and even if you cut the uh, body you may find even the color of the uh, blood which is red and also in many cases the even the uh, hair is also preserved and this is one kind of preservation this is exceptional case of preservation and mostly we find them in siberia in northern uh, Europe and Asia. And next, please. Uh, there is another uh, uh, kind of preservation in which uh, the fossils are preserved intact. In fact, this is one of the um, basis for the uh, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, the making of Jurassic Park, in which the the theme of the park, the Jurassic Park, is that there was an a a mosquito which bites the uh, bites a dinosaur and it sucks its blood and then it the mosquito gets entombed in in resin resin of a pine tree so you know when you cut any pine, pine tree the uh, the resin falls down and this resin when slowly within a short period of time it hardens so if any animal falls into this resin, then it, it, it will be preserved intact. So you can see even the soft parts uh, of the animal. So that is how it has been uh, suggested that the dinosaur, uh, the uh, mosquito which sucked the blood of dinosaur was preserved in, uh, in the amber. And then subsequently scientists ext extract the blood from the, the mosquito and then they recreate the uh, dinosaurs. That is the theme of the Jurassic Park. So like that, uh, in fact, you can find uh, these uh, uh, skeletons of the uh, small animals like the like frogs and insects, various kinds of insects uh, uh, from these uh, ambers. So in fact, we have uh, such, uh, most of these ambers come from the Baltic region in, uh, in the Eastern Europe and also uh, uh, from Africa and in India, we have also uh, one area which is in Surat, uh, where you have the Vasan lignite mine. So in the lignites, we have uh, uh, the uh, amber. So amber occurs with the lignite deposits, and this amber, this amber has yielded at least uh, uh, about fifty species of arthropods. So the the amber contained many of these uh, uh, arthropod species. Next, please. And then I, I told you that we have also microfossils. These are the coccolith. These are the calcareous uh, uh, fossils of the uh, phytoplankton, calcareous uh, uh, phytoplankton, which is known as nano nanoplankton. And then we have the uh, because they are very small in size. They are uh, they occur in different uh, shapes and in very beautiful shapes. And then we have also shells of these. Um, uh, animals with the protestants the foraminifers and diatoms and radiolarians these are again protestants and then we have the dinoflagellates and uh, uh, also ostracores the arthropods all of them are uh, placed under microfossils because they're very small in size you can see them only under the microscope but they are very important for uh, <coughs> for uh, particularly in geology for dating the rocks and also for understanding the uh, environment, the uh, past environments. So that is why they are extensively used in uh, oil industry, in uh, hydrocarbon industry, to find the, uh, to know the type of environment because in certain env marine environments, most of the oil is generated. And also to, uh, suppose you have in one basin, oil was found and you find a certain type of fossils in that basin, and then you can actually correlate or relate these fossils with the other basins and see if we have the same kind of uh, fossils there and see whether they, are, they have the same kind of environment and same and they are of, of the same age, then you can actually predict that that basin, which is uh, which has not been explored earlier, it may have some oil. So this is how they, uh, it is used in the oil industry. Next, please. So uh, these, uh, uh, most of the exceptional preservations, they fall under two categories. That is, uh, this is Lazarstraten is a German term, which means uh, the, these are the exceptional preservations. So we have the concentration deposits, 
and then the conservation deposits. Concentration deposits are those uh, where the animals get trapped uh, in some of the uh, places like, for example, fissure fillings in the limestone terrain where we have the caverns. So many of the animals fall into the caverns and they get preserved as fossils. And also tar pits, for example, we have the Rancola Bria uh, in Los Angeles, which is a, a, a Pleistocene deposit, which uh, is a tar pit. And uh, the animals which are, because tar pits, as you can see, even on the roads, when you have the uh, 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 when you travel on the road, you can see during the summer time the reflection of the light. It shows uh, as if it is there is a there is some water. So this mirage uh, uh, attract many of the animals to the uh, these tar pits, and then they get entom they are trapped in the tar pit, and because of the noxious gases that the uh, are released in the tar pit, they, they die and they get preserved as fossils. So we have large quantities of mammals have been reported from Rancola Bria in Los Angeles uh, uh, from these pits. So, but, and then we have also uh, river beds. Some, sometimes the river, when it carries the uh, sediments, uh, uh, along the sediments, it also uh, collects the various animals which died on the way and then these animals if they have the hard parts they will be carried further downstream and when the velocity of the river decreases then the bed load the sediment and all the uh, uh, skeleton and all shells etc they get uh, deposited at some place so that is a, a ch river channel beds where you find sometimes bones for example so these are actually and are also uh, these in these uh, kinds of deposits, you find selectively, uh, some of the animals have been selectively taken out of the ecosystem. Only a few of them uh, get deposited. Whereas here, in this case, in the conservation type, the most of the animals which are living there, they get deposited. The ecosystem, uh, the major component of the ecosystem is preserved. So like you have the stagnant basins in the oceans where the oxygen is very poor. In those conditions, the most of the animals which die in this in that area, they get preserved as fossils because the most of the anaerobic bacteria are not there. Then sometimes when you have the continental shelf, the sediments which accumulate along the continental shelf, once the, uh, the amount of sediment that accumulating along the continental shelf is very high, then the uh, uh, sediments will slide along the slope and then the, they carry along with them all the animals living here and they get deposited here and they get buried. Uh, so in this way, they get uh, preserved as fossils. So next please. So these are some of the exceptional preservations. So like this, uh, this is the, these are the, some of the uh, fossil trees in erect position with the roots, uh, which have been reported from 350 million year old rocks in Scotland. Then we have the crustacean, for example, here, the complete uh, uh, body form of the crustacean. Uh, this is from uh, some of the eocene. Uh, these are about um, 40, 48 million years old rocks from Barmer district in Rajasthan. And sometimes you can also have uh, well-preserved shells. For example, this is an um, uh, ammonite shell, uh, which shows the, even the color of the shell was preserved. So the melanosomes also get preserved uh, in some of the uh, fossils. And then the famous uh, Archaeopteryx, which is uh, the bird fossil, the earliest bird fossil known uh, anywhere in the world. So this Archaeopteryx uh, is preserved along with the feather. If you remove the feathers, the impression, impressions of the feather, uh, it cannot be identified as a bird because all the characters that you see here, they're mostly of those of the uh, dinosaurs. So we don't see any other characters except the feathers and the foot. In the foot, you can see that the it has toes, three toes pointing forward, one pointing backward, like in birds. So that is the, those are the characters which bring them close to the birds. 
and in some cases even the skin impressions for example this is a, a skin impression of a cretaceous dinosaur uh, which is preserved in uh, montana uh, and uh, uh, this of course these are Uh, relatively rare cases but you find such kind of preservations also these are also very exceptional preservations and then here you can see this is a these are the gill filaments of the fish of a modern fish and these are the gill filaments of the uh, fossils so they are uh, exceptionally well preserved here in this case uh, this comes from brazil and next please and so those are the body fossils now coming to the trace fossils trace fossils as uh, as i mentioned earlier these are the tracks trails burrows uh, and also uh, tooth marks and even the footprints and uh, eggshells for example eggshells also they are also considered as um, trace fossils and so uh, these are uh, very common in most of the sedimentary rocks and uh, only uh, we have a trace of the actual animal like for example here you can see this is a footprint of a sauropod dinosaur so then you can also have some of the traces like the uh, gastroliths these are the stomach stones or gizzard stones so many of the birds even now many birds use the they swallow the stones to digest the food material so uh, we find these uh, gastroliths in sauropod dinosaurs which actually uh, uh, used to eat uh, large quantities of uh, plant material and to digest them they uh, used to swallow the these stones so because we find these stones inside the stomachs of the sauropod dinosaurs next please and then we have the uh, footprints like this these are the uh, footprints with three toes pointing forward so this is the characteristic of uh, some of the predatory dinosaurs the uh, carnivorous dinosaurs and uh, this is also found in birds and uh, here you can also see some of the tracks which are left by these animals these are the marine animals which lived between 540 million years and 250 million years so these are known as trilobites and trilobites they when they because they have the appendages on the on the lateral side of the body and when they move over the sediment they make these uh, uh, tracks so this kind of uh, tracks are uh, they have this this actually they come from kashmir uh, hundwara district in kashmir this is the trilobite and the Uh, tracks made by some of these trilobites and then we can see here the tubular structures these are actually the burrow uh, burrows of the uh, some of the soft bodied animals next please and uh, we have also uh, besides these uh, tracks and trails and footprints you know, we have also other uh, trace fossils known as coprolites coprolites are actually the fossil dung the fecal matter so this is a coprolite of a dinosaur fossil dinosaur uh, sauropod dinosaur from maharashtra so when we study these uh, uh, coprolites we find several interesting things because sometimes you may think that uh, what will you find in fossil dung in, a, in, a, in dung but you can actually find out what kind of vegetation the animal was feeding on or what kind of uh, uh, the habitat for example if they are uh, taking water from a, a pond or a, a lake the water may contain some of the microscopic organisms like these ostracores or the diatoms and they also get swallowed during the uh, when they take the water so so those also get preserved in the coprolites and what you are seeing here the arrow is pointing to some of the organic material this is the plant material which is preserved in the uh, Uh, in this uh, coprolite so you can see the black ones and then uh, here the uh, these are the phytoliths phytoliths are the uh, uh, dumbbell bell shaped uh, structures which are the silica cells which are preserved in most of the uh, grass grasses have this kind of uh, structure so they are found uh, in those uh, plants so they can also be found and here what you are seeing is the, are the late triassic late triassic is about 
130 million years old coprolites from uh, PG Valley. And uh, and when we uh, before the uh, studying these coprolites, we had no idea whether there were what kind of vegetation was there during that period because all the sediments that we have uh, all the all the rocks that we have in the uh, uh, malari formation from which they have been recovered they are essentially red colored sediments and sandstones so red colored sediments because they they because of the uh, oxidation the uh, iron is converted into uh, iron oxide and so we have uh, 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 highly oxidized sediments here so normally plant fossils they do not get in oxidized sediments so and mostly they are preserved in reducing environments so we when we uh, before analyzing these coprolites we did not we, we had no idea what kind of vegetation was there but when we analyze these coprolites we found that there are about uh, 45 species of plants, uh, plant pollen and spores in these uh, coprolites. That is how you can gain a lot of information from these coprolites. Next, please. And uh, also here, uh, this is the same coprolite from Maharashtra, uh, which has yielded all these uh, uh, spindle shaped structures. These are the silica uh, cells of the grasses. Here, in this case, these are the uh, this they belong to the rice tribe, Poveseae. Poveseae is a rice tribe, and they have been found in the uh, these coprolites. So before this finding, most of the fossils of the grasses they came from around 35 million years or so. But here we have the uh, grasses, grass fossils coming from the 66 million year old dinosaur fossils. So that that has taken back the time of origin of the grasses at least by uh, uh, another 25 million years. So this is a very important finding which was published in uh, Science. Next, please. And then we have also eggshells, eggs, for example, this is the dinosaur egg and you have the chicken egg. And here, these are the elliptical eggs which belong to the carnivorous dinosaurs. And these circular ones, these are the spherical ones, they belong to the uh, sauropod dinosaurs. And here, what you are seeing is actually a cross section of the uh, uh, egg. So this is the shell, the margin of the shell. And the uh, and this here, uh, you have a egg which has the uh, embryonic skeleton inside. And uh, so the Eggshells and eggs are considered as trace fossils because we do not know exactly to which animal it belongs, which species or which genus they belong. Because it's difficult unless, for example, here, you know that this is there is a skeleton and this skeleton can be identified with the uh, body fossil. So it has been identified as a massospondylus dinosaur, but many of the eggs, they do not contain any skeletons. In such cases, they are trace fossils. If you find this kind of uh, skeletons, then you can identify it as a body fossil. Next, please. So there is a, also, we have the molecular fossils. These are mostly the breakdown products of the various uh, organic compounds like the chlorophyll, lignin, lipids, and carbohydrates. And they're highly useful because uh, uh, in the uh, before 540 million years, most of the fossil record, the, the fossil record is very poor because uh, most of the organisms, they do not have, they did not have the uh, hard skeletons. So that's why they did, uh, they did not get preserved as fossils. So in such cases, uh, it is only biomarkers, the uh, uh, degraded products, organic uh, compounds of the animals, which can help us to identify various kinds of uh, uh, organisms present uh, at that time. So like that, we can also use them for uh, various other purposes, like uh, we have been using it to know in places where we don't find any fossils, we uh, actually, the biomarkers help us to identify the kind of uh, vegetation or the animals present. Next, please. And then we have the living fossils. 
uh, probably understand uh, what is a living fossil. Uh, uh, these are the uh, organisms like the plants or animals which have remained almost unchanged for millions of years. For example, here we have a silicanth fish, which is the, this is the modern one and this is the fossil one. They are more or less similar. Similarly, the uh, ginkgo, the plant ginkgo, it's very similar to what we have in the Jurassic around 150 million years ago. Then horseshoe crab like this, they are very similar to each other. And then the didentid uh, marsupial, this is from the Cretaceous period, but this is the modern marsupial, and they are very similar to each other. So they are known as the living fossils. Next, please. Then where can we find uh, fossils? So as I told you earlier, when you go to the field in search of fossils, you should always look for sedimentary rocks. So because these are the only rocks where you can find the fossils, well-preserved fossils only in sedimentary rocks. And the uh, places where you may look for are the mostly uh, shallow calm seas. For example, the sediments which are deposited in shallow marine environments river deltas and lagoons and in deserts deserts also uh, for example mongolia is is the best example for uh, the sandstones which are preserved in uh, in the in mongolia cretaceous sandstones they have yielded of uh, beautifully preserved skeletons of dinosaurs and mammals so uh, these are the places where you can look for and also these are normally it is the fine fine grained sediments like for example limestones mudstones shales these are the uh, these are the good uh, rock types in which you can find um, the fossils uh, well preserved fossils actually you can also find fossils in coarse grained sediments also but mostly the the preservation is not so good because they have been transported for long distances so in many cases they have been broken into fragments but if you want to see well-preserved fossils, it's the fine grained sediments which actually preserve such kind of fossils. Next, please. And the conditions which are uh, uh, suitable for fossil preservation are mostly the, uh, the, the, the animal or the organism which died, it should have some hard parts like shell, wood, bone, etc., so that the hard parts can get uh, preserved. Uh, Whereas the soft tissues like skin and muscles, they uh, easily decay uh, once they are subjected to the uh, atmospheric conditions. Then the environment should be oxygen free because anaerobic bacteria, they decompose the organic material very fast. Then the deposition should be away from wave action. That's why when you go to the beach, you will find lots of shells uh, with broken shells along the in the beach sands so so that's the reason that they should always be deposited away from the wave action in a calm conditions then rapid rapid burial it's more it's very important so if the once the animal dies if immediately it is covered by sediment uh, there is a greater chance of preservation and also <clears throat> uh, the where they are actually deposited so swamps, lakes, and deltas, lowland floodplains, these are the places where the uh, most of the animals, once they die, they settle down to the bottom of the water body, and then they get covered by the sediments. These are the places where uh, uh, good preservation can take place. Next, please. And the field collection, uh, uh, most of the time, uh, people ask us, how do you know where are the fossils when you go to the field so in fact there is no uh, formula to know where the fossils are it is actually uh, it involves a lot of hard work and you need to spend a lot of time looking for fossils um, and you have to walk a lot along the uh, stream cuts and also road cuts and wherever there are exposures like the badlands for example these are the places where you have to uh, keep walking and see for some clues. For example, in many cases, you can find some clues, for ex uh, like uh, you may find a shell fragment 
shell of an invertebrate fossil, or you may find a bone fragment or a tooth of a, a shark. So you can immediately uh, conclude that the fossils are somewhere around, and then you should look for. So suppose it is coming from a higher ground, then you should, from the channel, from the stream channel, you should move up towards the higher ground and see from which level it is coming. So that is how you can actually look for. So some uh, there are always some clues which you find in the field. And then once your eyes are set uh, on fossils, then it's easy to find them if they're available there. Then the choice of rocks as, of course, it is always sedimentary and the rocks of right age. So if you want to look for dinosaur fossils, you should not look in rocks of 500 million years. So you should look in rocks between 230 million years and 65 million years. Uh, that is the time period during which dinosaur lived. Likewise, if you want to look for trilobites, you should not look in uh, 65 million year old rocks or Cretaceous rocks or Jurassic rocks. And then uh, if they are marine, whether the, if the, if you are looking for dinosaur fossils, then you should look in terrestrial sediments, not in marine sediments. Then the suitable rocks are generally is the fine grain rocks, rocks as, men, as I told you earlier, limestone, shale, mudstone. These are the rocks which contain abundant fossils. Sandstones relatively less as compared to these, but conglomerate. This is these are the uh, uh, which contain a lot of pebbles and bold, boulders. They do not contain any fossils. Relatively rare. And suitable sites, of course, railroad cutting, stream and river banks, badlands, these are the places where you can find uh, fossils. Next, please. So uh, this is uh, how we can actually uh, excavate a, a bone in the field. Like this is a humerus of a dinosaur, sauropod dinosaur, in the Kaveri Basin in uh, Tamil Nadu. And initially, we found like this. And then we try to excavate it. Uh, by digging around it, we make a pedestal so that the bone stands above the pedestal and we remove all the materials uh, around it. And then finally, we make a, uh, these are the steps that we have followed. And then finally, we put the plaster Paris. So we put gunny bag, uh, we uh, put a, a layer of gunny bag over it, wet gunny bag. And then we pour plaster Paris and then we allow it to dry. And after that, we cut the pedestal from beneath and then turn it upside down and put uh, again uh, a gunny bag and plaster of Paris so that the bone remains intact and it can be transported easily without any breakage uh, to the lab where we can actually prepare the bone uh, uh, more systematically. Next, please. So this is, these are the, some of the tools that we use uh, in the lab, like uh, uh, small fossils. Normally, we use these uh, simple needles, small needles. But when we are looking at very hard rocks, uh, then we have to use these pneumatic tools, the vibro tools, which are uh, actually driven by a, a compressor. And then we can, uh, but it is a long process. It takes very long time. Uh, many times, if you have your actually preparing a dinosaur bone, it will take uh, maybe uh, three to four months or even more in case of complete skeleton, it may take a few years. And then we can also use this sand blaster, which actually uh, puts a lot of sand at a high pressure onto the uh, rock and it removes much of the uh, inorganic mineral material from the rock. And that is uh, done mainly to expose the uh, to bring the bone to the surface. But once you the bone is exposed, you cannot use this sand blaster. And of course, we also use the microscopes with the, these vibro tools to remove the uh, material. Next, please. And then uh, the next stage is mounting of the specimen. So if you are mounting a dinosaur specimen, it is a very cumbersome job. It takes a long time because you need to put a lot of uh, drill holes into the bones because these are huge and they are, uh, weigh uh, several hundreds of kilos. And so you have to put some support from the rooftop and also uh, from the bottom. So this is one skeleton of a sauropod dinosaur, first uh, documented dinosaur from India. 
so not first actually the oldest dinosaur which was documented from the pg valley pranayata godavari valley and uh, this uh, is another dinosaur which has been reported from the same area so this is now located in birla science center in hyderabad and this is in indian statistical institute uh, museum in calcutta uh, so this uh, takes a lot of time a long period of time uh, to mount the specimens for display next please so uh, what can we gain from the uh, by studying the fossils so uh, in geology basically we use them to understand the uh, age of the rocks because before the radiometric methods or the radioactivity was discovered it is only the fossils which uh, were used for dating the rocks so and also it also provides uh, clues the past environments and ecosystems how the ecosystems changed over time and how the biodiversity has changed over time and climate has changed uh, through time then fossils are the best evidences for the evolution of life uh, uh, because we have several such examples where you have a complete sequence of fossils which give you clues about how the animals had evolved from most primitive forms to the the more derived forms and the it also uh, we can also know about the past distribution of land and see how the continents were distributed in the past so this is what we know we, we call continental drift or plate tectonics and as i told you earlier they are useful in search for hydrocarbons next please so how, how do we date rocks so this is known as uh, relative dating in which uh, it is assumed most of the sedimentary rocks are deposited layer by layer so once the uh, sand mud and clay get deposited they form a layer and subsequently another layer is formed like this they get deposited uh, in a, a sequence and so the sediments which are deposited at the bottom these are the oldest and the sediments which are deposited they are the youngest so this is the uh, uh geology this is known as the law of superposition in uh, we have a principle in geology so uh, this is how the layers get deposited uh, when the sediments uh, uh, are laid in aquatic bodies and so we have uh, so this is how uh, we use the law of uh, or the principle of superposition to relatively date the rocks if there are no fossils we simply can say that these are the oldest and these are the youngest and uh, these cutting across the uh, rocks these are the younger uh, rocks uh, and next please so we use in uh, in geology we use uh, the index fossils index fossils are those fossils uh, which have very short evolutionary rate very short span of uh, evolution uh, they have evolved very fast like for example you have the rodents at the uh, in the terrestrial system you know the rodents they evolve very rapidly similarly in the marine system we have the Uh, foraminifers which evolve very rapidly and so they and they have wide geographic distribution because they get distributed very uh, fast because these are the plankton so zooplankton for example so they uh, the planktic foraminifers they get distributed by the waves winds and currents uh, to longer distances so you can actually use them to know when exactly the sediments were deposited uh, Uh, by using these uh, fossils the index fossils which are very short geological range and very wide geographic distribution and which occur in great abundance so next please so here you can see uh, you have uh, two uh, this is one section of a, uh, a rock in one outcrop in one place this is in another place so here in this case the older sediments like here the older sediment is 3 the roman uh, number 3 and younger is the number 2 as per the uh, order of superposition and then we have the above that you have the number 1 so if uh, here in this outcrop you don't find this 
number three, but you have number two and number one. So once we know that this bed can be correlated with this, and this bed may be in another section, this bed may be preserved, so that can be correlated with. So we can make a composite section. So we can place this uh, two over this three, and we can actually uh, make a composite section like we have made here. Three is here, two is here, and one is here. So in this way, we initially the geolo geological time scale was built in this manner. So we have divided the rocks on the basis of the fossils which are present. So we have a set of fossils in three, a set of fossils in two, and a set of fossils in one. So based on that, the geological uh, the rock sequence has been divided into a number of periods, and these are. Uh, next please you can i think this uh, picture is not very good but the names like for example cambrian ordovician devonian carboniferous pennsylvanian uh, mississippian permian triassic jurassic and cretaceous these are all the names given based on these divisions so you have a, a, a sequence this is kaibab uh, sandstone so this kaibab sandstone sits here over here and then this uh, rock sequence, um, this uh, actually this one is uh, here. So this will sit here. So you can actually build a composite uh, uh, column of these rocks and they have been named on the basis of the fossils which are present in them. So in this way, the geological time scale has been uh, made in the earlier times. Next please. So as you can see here, uh, this is how the uh, rocks have been divided and they were placed in a composite section. And so you can see various kinds of fossils here, the marine fossils, then you have the fishes here in the Devonian, and then plants in the Carboniferous, and then reptiles in the Carboniferous, and dinosaurs in the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Like this, we have built the uh, uh, geological time scale. And later, when we found after radioactivity was discovered, if you have datable uh, material, like for example, you have the, some volcanic or igneous rocks, which can be, which contain most of the radioactive elements, they can be dated using the radioactive methods, uh, uh, radiometric methods. So then the ages were placed along this uh, time scale. So the ge geological time scale, which was divided on the basis of the fossils, it remained as it is, but only we have added the numbers the ages. So this is how it was built uh, using the fossils. Next, please. So we have different uh, methods which have been used. I'll quickly go through it because I, I think we have already um, have taken more time. Uh, so the radiocarbon dating is the method which is mostly used for dating rocks which are about less than 50,000 years and we cannot use them for older rocks uh, because its half-life is only 5,730 5, 5, plus or minus 40 years. Whereas there are other methods which, uh, can you uh, go to the next slide, please? So we have many other methods which are used for dating rocks, uh, which are very old. For example, you can use potassium argon method, rubidium strontium method, uranium lead method uh, for dating rocks much, much older. And uh, this is used for most of the older rocks. And for younger rocks, you have the methods like the dendrochronology, thermoluminescence, electron spin resonance, and amino acid racemization method. But these are relatively less used, but mostly they're used for the younger uh, rocks, which are younger than 100,000 years. Next, please. So uh, fossils also help us to understand the behavior of the animals, the function of various uh, bones as well as or the shells and also the behavior of the animals. For example, uh, in Egg Mountain in uh, Montana, where we have a, a series of uh, uh, nesting sites, uh, one above the other, where you can find that the dinosaur eggs were laid in pits. And, and they were laid within some vegetable matter is there within the pit and on that the egg, eggs were laid and then we can also see the hatchlings the young ones which have hatched out of the egg they they have not developed the bones very well so the bones are not 
mature so they have not ossified well so the the offsprings they could not have walked away from the nest to find food therefore based on that it has been inferred that these animals were actually uh, which are known as uh, myasora the mother dinosaur so they could they might have come to the nesting sites to feed the uh, young uh, offsprings so that is how you can infer from the nest similarly there is one nest where a animal skeleton was found above the eggs these are the eggs and these are some of the eggs and you, here you can see the skeleton above the nest and this has been interpreted in terms of brooding so the animal the mother uh, was brooding over the uh, nest so like many of the birds do nowadays so the same manner they actually they were sitting over the nest to uh, so that the eggs get enough uh, heat next please and then uh, they can be the fossils can be used to know the type of environment in which the animals were living so suppose you have the these animals today they are living essentially in marine waters so here the principle that we follow is the present is the key to the past so this is the hartonian principle james hutton gave this principle the so whatever uh, processes that are happening on the earth surface they happened in the past also therefore things uh, uh, from this angle and so the these brachiopods which basically live in marine waters they if you have brachiopods in your uh, rocks that means that rocks were deposited in marine environment similarly if you have sea lilies like this the crinoids then you can also interpret that this this was a marine environment and then if you have a trilobite again it is a marine environment but you have a, a dinosaur fossil or a, a a pine tree so which normally live in terrestrial conditions you can interpret that this is a environment which is continental and then if you have corals again corals are marine uh, animals so they also indicate marine environment next please so we can also uh, use them for a paleoecological reconstruction how the ecosystems were uh, in the past so how they have changed so if you have a assemblage of fossils which is preserved in situ which have not been transported from other areas then you can actually interpret what kind of ecosystem was there so you can build the food web and everything you can build like this in this case and also this is actually the uh, the ecosystem that was present before the the major mass extinction at 250 million years ago so this uh, uh, the animals were thriving during this period but when immediately after the extinction what you see is the ecosystem is like this and these are the some of the ecosystems which were uh, reconstructed for triassic Uh, when we had the dinosaurs so this is again based on the not only on the animal fossils but also the plant fossils which lived during that period based on that you can actually reconstruct the ecosystem of that time and similarly you can also use the fossils to know the climate how the climate was suppose you have corals in your uh, rock then you can say that this is a a tropical environment so because corals they do not occur beyond the equatorial bend so likewise the plants are the best uh, indicators for climate so because if you move from one latitude to another latitude you'll find different kinds of plants so the plants can be used uh, very well for uh, reconstructing the past climate next please and then uh, of course the most important thing is the evolution of life the fossils provide the best evidence for the evolution of life the one of the best examples is the uh, is that of horses for example uh, in north america we have a complete sequence of horses starting from the earliest horse to the the modern horse so all the stages are represented well represented here so this based on this you can actually uh, know how the various anatomical features had evolved over time from the earliest horse to the modern horse how the uh, like for example their teeth 
for example, they have changed from simple teeth or very low crown teeth to very high crown teeth in the later times because of the evolution of the grasses. So the horses, initially they were browsing, browsing on forest foliage, but uh, la in the latter times, when the grasslands appeared, uh, they, they appeared ex uh, on the surface of the earth uh, for uh, extensively, then the animals have adopted for eating grasses because grasses, they contain silica and silica, it erodes the teeth very fast. That's why they had evolved very high crown teeth and also the lengthening of the uh, foot or the uh, limb bones. Uh, this also happened with the, as the uh, animals evolved over time. Next, please. And then uh, there is another best example from the Indian subcontinent, that is the evolution of whales. So the uh, earliest animal, which is considered as a, a sister group for the whales is this. This is Indohyus, it's, a, it's an artiodactyl mammal. Artiodactyls are the mammals which have even, toed, uh, uh, even number of toes and perissodactyls are the animals which have odd number of toes. So this comes from the gem, uh, from the Eocene rocks of Jammu and Kashmir, about 48 million years. And this um, uh, skeleton, uh, from based on this skeleton, it has been found that the, the, the histology of the bones, it has been found that this animal has adopted for a life in water. Although it was a terrestrial animal, it also spent some time in water. And then comes the next stage, which is uh, represented by Pakisitas. It comes from Pakistan, from 52 million years old rocks. So we have the same kind of rocks occurring in Pakistan and India. And these are the this is the skeleton and of the Pakisitas, which is still a terrestrial animal, but has adopted well adopted for aquatic life, and it was feeding on fishes. The teeth indicate this animal was actually feeding on fishes. Then comes the uh, next stage is Ambulocetus, which again comes from Pakistan. And there uh, it is the limbs, the hind limbs, they have uh, now become well adopted for swimming. So it was partially uh, land animal and partially aquatic animal. So it has become amphibious. So this uh, evolution, for, uh, the, these various evolutionary stages from India, they show how a, a terrestrial animal has moved uh, from the land to water. The transition from uh, land to water is, has been uh, very well depicted in the fossils of the whales from India. So uh, next please. So if you look at this uh, uh, phylogenetic tree of the uh, whales, you will see uh, this is hindo hyas which is a sister group for the whales. And then we have the uh, Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, then Cachycetus, which comes from Kach, and Rhodocetus, which comes from both, um, uh, mostly from um, Kach and also from Pakistan. And uh, so the entire sequence from, say, about 50 million years to uh, about 35 million years or so, 10 to 15 million years, the early, the earliest evolution of the whales, it took place in the Indian subcontinent. And then after that, the whales started moving out, out of India into other uh, areas. Like for example, they have moved towards Egypt and also Southern part of North America and towards South America in the latter stages. So until then, the evolution, they originated in India, and they evolved in India. And finally, they have given rise to these modern uh, uh, whales. So uh, next please. And also fossils provide uh, uh, best evidence for biodiversity changes over geological time. So uh, using marine uh, invertebrates, uh, this kind of cow has been prepared. And this uh, shows that there were periods of uh, diversification, radiation of organisms like this one that is during the Cambrian, there is a slight slump here. But again, there was a very high rise in the biodiversity. And then we have a 
uh, low diversity uh, time here at the end of the Ordovician period around 450 million years ago and another one at 370 million years and the third one the most devastating uh, mass extinction that took place at the end of the Permian time that around 250 million years ago and the fourth one is at 200 million years between Triassic and Jurassic junction or the boundary and the fifth one is at Cretaceous and uh, Paleocene or Paleogene uh, boundary so where the dinosaurs became extinct so these are the five major mass extinctions that occurred during the last 540 million years. So this is possible mainly through the study of the fossil uh, record. So where we have the excellent fossil records that have been used to uh, understand how these mass extinctions occurred over time. Next, please. The fossils are also used for uh, uh, understanding the past distribution of life, uh, also the continents, uh, the land and sea. So this is actually uh, was uh, the first um, suggestion was made by Alfred Wegener, a, a meteorologist from Germany, who looked at the distribution of the plant fossils like this uh, one, the Glossopteris, is found in all the southern continents. So based on that, he proposed that there was a connection between these land masses in the past. Similarly, we have the fossils like the Mesosaurus, uh, aquatic reptile. Which, is, uh, which lives basically in fluvial uh, sediments, that is um, freshwater sediments. It, it is known from Brazil and also from South of, uh, Africa. So based on that, it has been suggested that these continents were together at one point of time. So based on that, it has been proposed that the continents were together in a, uh, uh, they, they were assembled into a single supercontinent known as Pangaea and later, it, it got fragmented and they drifted apart. So these are the, some of the uh, uh, utilities of uh, fossils, studying fossils. So you can use them in different, um, uh, as, uh, for understanding different aspects of uh, uh, biology as well as geology. So uh, if you have any questions or doubts, you can ask me. Uh, yes, sir. Team sharing for now. Yes, please. So I had a question. Yeah, please. Uh, so, sir, in schools, it is taught through diagrams of soil layering that the more deeper you dig, more old fossils you will find. Is this universally true? And why and what is the uh, uh, It's basically, as I mentioned in the uh, earlier slides, that the deposition of the sediments, it takes place layer by layer. So, if the horizontality of the sediments is not disturbed, in such cases, you will find, definitely you will find the older sediments at the bottom and the younger sediments at the top. So, so uh, uh, that's the reason uh, you will find the older fossils at the at the uh, lower levels and the younger fossils at the higher levels. But if the sediments have been disturbed uh, during their deposition, after their deposition, if they have been subjected to compression, folding, and faulting, then they can you can also find younger fossils at the bottom and the older fossils at the top if they are overturned the sediments are overturned so this can happen in uh, many of the orogenies where the mountain building takes place there due to compression this can happen uh, thrusting of this uh, rocks over the other rocks it will take place in such cases the older uh, rocks overlie over the younger rocks okay sir uh, thank you so yeah. much sir Sir, I have a follow up on this. So, uh, when the uh, like uh, when the layering has been formed, and uh, for uh, for uh, we let's assume that there is no uh, dis uh, disturbance in the sedimentation. So, uh, how the top like after like say a million years or so, how new layers are forming on top of it? Is is it due to the wind or the top soil is? Uh, uh, yeah, most of the in the most of the cases, it is the water which plays a major role. So, most of the rivers, for example rivers and it is the the best undisturbed sequence normally it is found in the ocean where there is not much disturbance so the sediments they accumulate slowly and then they get deposited the sand silt and the clay they get deposited and layer by layer they form uh, continuously so may, there might be some breaks like for example if you have a uh, uh, fall in sea level 
so you may you can have a, a break but uh, otherwise it is a it's more continuous in the even the uh, uh, deposits which are formed by the rivers by the action of the rivers they also have a more continuous sequence and even of course you can also get uh, these layering even in case of uh, the uh, deserts desert also you can find similar kind of layering but this is more common in aquatic bodies where they have the the water plays a major role in uh, this kind of layering good evening sir yeah uh, sir this is sorapal from uh, geologist from the geological survey of india sir my question is regarding the humerus bone of the sauropod dinosaur that you have shown in one of your slide from the kaveri basin you said that it is from the kaveri basin Sir, uh, yeah. regarding that, I want to ask uh, if that bone is in similar dimension to the the previously described titanosaur from there, the Bruchiosaurus. Yeah, uh, it's actually uh, there is a, a debate over the reliability of the Bruchiosaurus uh, because uh, some have doubted its identity, and also I I do not know whether where the specimens are preserved in the geological survey of uh, hyderabad uh, uh, circle or where um, Sir, because the fossil uh, is actually being lost uh, actually not being lost but actually the fossil is being fragmented to the dust before reaching yeah, the repository of uh, hyderabad the, yes i the, uh, that is the case here in in uh, kalamedu uh, in kaveri basin most of the bones have been subjected to uh, weathering and they are so fragile sometimes it's very difficult to extract them from the sediments in many cases i have seen cases where the bone is uh, the shape outline of the bone is there but all the bone uh, the uh, parts of the bone are broken into smaller fragments so it's difficult to pick them from the field this is only case where you can see in some cases we we found some vertebrae also which are relatively well preserved and so we have we could ex extract them so otherwise uh, the preservation is very poor there sir regarding this bone uh, is it uh, is it is being uh, published no it's not published so because uh, the uh, problem with that is uh, we have faced the same problem uh, when we try to pre prepare it in the lab uh, it crumbled into pieces so the main problem here is we have sand and clay mix mixture in the sediments so that makes the uh, when during the when the uh, we had rains the clay swells and during the summer it it contracts so we, it gets actually uh, and the clay is present in between the sand so it actually it makes it very difficult to preserve sir actually uh, I, i just uh, one question sir uh, what is the length of this humerus can you please tell Uh, it's about uh, you can see that um, it's uh, near here you can see the hammer in the picture so it's uh, almost a three and a half uh, hammers so nearly uh, it's more than this is about a feet or so so uh, about a meter more than meter in length okay so the so uh, it could belong to a new species sir as uh, suspected by the matley sir actually matley also uh, described uh, Uh, these fragmented uh, some large size fragmented limb bones yeah. and he hypothesized yes. uh, that uh, that these bones must have been belonging to uh, some very large size titanosaur so uh, yeah. th regarding that uh, sir so yeah it's very uh, difficult i mean if you have uh, such fragmentary material it's very difficult to identify them maybe you can just say on the basis of the uh, length of the bone you can say that it's a huge animal but uh, otherwise uh, unless uh, the ends are preserved the ends of the bone are preserved it's difficult to identify okay sir okay sir so uh, any any more uh... hello sir this is anjukta chakravarti i am a phd student of vertebrate mm -hmm. paleontology and uh, thank you for such a nice talk i followed the talk throughout uh, but uh, Uh, the place where you showed the, the entire transition uh, to higher mammals uh, starting from the fishes uh, i just wanted to mention that uh, uh, i did not notice the amphibians there so uh, here you can see this this is the i just uh, mentioned about the different okay, types of okay. animals and i didn't talk about the uh, transitions so transition of yeah. course this is these are the amphibians we have so 
and okay, then you so have the mammal so here. Uh, bird, uh, bird thank here. you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Just to show uh, how the geological time scale was made using the fossils. That is. Yeah, I understand. Not that. Yeah, yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Sir, I have a question. Yes, please. Sir, so why are there fossil hotspots? That is, uh, fossils found in a specific region. What is the chance that a dinosaur fossil will be found beneath my house? No, it uh, depends on uh, where you are sitting. So if you are uh, located on, uh, say, a marine sequence, marine rocks, then you may not find any dinosaurs. So uh, it has to be over a continental sequence where you have the terrestrial deposits. There you may find. Sometimes you may find some dinosaurs in a marine sequence if they are transported from the land. But they are very rare. Only some bones, isolated bones. But normally you don't find. So uh, it depends on where you are living and where you are actually uh, looking for. So if you are looking in the central India, for example, uh, around the Narmada Valley, you may find dinosaur bones. So if you are looking in Kaveri Basin, you may find uh, sharks because this is a marine sequence. Similarly, even in the Narmada Valley, there are places like uh, uh, near uh, Manavar and other places, there you have the marine bog beds. So where you find mostly marine fossils, but above that you have the Lamata formation in which you find the dinosaur fossils. So it depends on where uh, you're looking. So it depends on the geology, geology of the area. Okay, thank you, sir. Hello. Yes, please. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, uh, as, far as, as far as I have observed, paleontology is very uncertain field and highly luck dependent. So with the increasing urbanization, uh, what do you think is the future of the subject? Like in general, I think and in I, India both? Yeah, I I know I understand that because uh, we have also faced the problems because in many places uh, where we visited uh, in one year we find some fossils there and when we go back uh, it is uh, actually under cultivation so the entire uh, horizon is lost the fossiliferous horizon but still we have many many deposits which are not unexplored for example if you take uh, the Himalayas the Tethian sequence of the uh, northern part of the Himalaya, where we have a thick sequence of marine rocks. And this sequence have not been worked by anybody to see whether they have any fossils, because uh, I mean, vertebrate fossil, for example. Um, uh, when you compare with China, it, they uh, have the same uh, biogeogra biogeographic province. So you should find similar fossils that we are finding in China, but so far, uh, there are very few people actually working there, and we don't uh, uh, have any uh, record at the moment. So only a few fossils have been reported from Spiti and a few from uh, uh, Kashmir. But otherwise, uh, hardly, even in, in what invertebrates also, vertebrates, I'm talking about vertebrates, but even in invertebrate fossils, very little work has been done. So a lot of uh, areas are yet to be explored. And likewise, you take the case of uh, Gondwana rocks, or you take the case of Cretaceous rocks, there are a lot of exposures yet to be explored. So uh, I, uh, yes, of course, so now the urbanization is actually uh, taking a toll on um, the exposures that are available, but still there are many places where you can work uh, at the moment. Sir, I have a follow-up. Okay, so can you also put, uh, throw yeah. some light on like, uh, since paleontology has a lot of application in other fields also because uh, so if we talk about uh, the Cretaceous extinction so due to the iridium layer we got to know about the meteors and so it has applications mm -hmm. in astrophysics and then genetics and environmental sciences also so why is there uh, like so less investment in this particular field especially in India like if we see in US and uh, other places we see uh, museums of natural history those have various yeah areas. that is um, there is a very interesting question uh, an important question uh, because uh, this is one problem that we are facing and we have been discussing for the, the last uh, few years about this. So in India, we don't have a, a, a national repository where you can deposit the fossils uh, so that uh, the future generations can uh, actually uh, have a look at them and see what heritage, natural heritage we have. Uh, that is not there. 
uh, we have the Indian Museum in Calcutta, but uh, I think uh, the, the, the main mandate of geological survey is to actually to map the uh, rock formations in India and find mineral deposits, etc. So therefore, there there is not much. <clears throat> uh, uh, the fossils are not kept well, and the displays are not so well as you see abroad. Uh, so that is one area which we have to improve, and uh, uh, I think uh, we should uh, have may several in fact not a single national natural history museum but we should have several regional museums like wherever you have a, a, a important uh, site where you find uh, uh, important fossils like for example in central india we have extensive nesting sites of dinosaurs so we should have a, a <clears throat> on-site uh, museums where people can come and see what we have uh in the rocks so that is at the moment is not uh, there and in fact we have been uh, many of us in the paleontological community we are trying to get at least one uh, at the national level and so that uh, all the all our natural heritage or the fossil heritage is preserved for the future and uh, sir, so has there any like uh, crowdfunded uh, sources appeared or maybe like a citizen science program so a general public can also help in this? Yes, that is that is one area that we should explore because uh, this, is, this is being done abroad. Uh, many uh, people are actually, some people actually getting grants for their field work through this uh, cloud funding. So that, that can be actually uh, uh, attempted here also. That is one uh, important suggestion that I think we should uh, consider uh, for future of these um, important fossils. So I had one question. Do mm -hmm. India offer anything special in terms of fossil record or ancient species as it started from an equatorial landmass to an island floating north and then colliding with Asia? Uh, what did you say? Uh, can you repeat it? Uh, do India offer anything special in terms of fossil record as it was formed yeah, by yeah. a collision of two land masses? Okay, okay. Yeah, I got it. Uh, the In fact, yeah, this is what we are working on, uh, how life has evolved when India moved from a southern hemisphere location. It, it was very close to the high latitudes uh, uh, around... 160 million years ago and from there it moved to the north and it moved very rapidly during the cretaceous it belongs to the family adapisoriculidae uh, so it, it is the oldest occurrence of this family and the, the younger uh, descendants they occur in africa and uh, europe so all this shows that india during its northward journey it had the the relics which it has received from the gondwana land and also it has endemic forms like this and also it has some uh, forms which actually arrived from the uh, northern hemisphere that is from eurasia so many of these uh, taxa they came from uh, across the tethys the shallow tethys into india so all these uh, are actually uh, all these things happened during this time period and so uh, that that's why the there's uh, many paleontologists and many biologists they show a lot of interest in looking at some of these uh, forms thank you sir um okay so before we wind up the webinar uh, we would like to have a photo session with all of you uh, and and sir as well so if you guys could all, all turn on your cameras that would be really nice all right i still see a lot of you haven't turned on your cameras come on yes if you could please switch on your cameras it will be really appreciated now, uh, before we wrap up with the session, I would like to thank Professor Prasad for such an enlightening webinar. I would also like to thank our wonderful audience who will be updated about our future webinars. You can follow the links on our social media channels and uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. And our other upcoming event is on the special occasion of National Science Day that is biocon on 27 and 28th of february 
and if you wish to be a part of the biology society the link will be provided in the chat box and also please fill out the feedback form thank you all for an amazing session today thank you thank you all thank you sir it was really insightful thank you thank you thanks a lot